Hello and welcome to this third lecture in our series of lectures on world history. <clears throat> this one is going to be on the Mesopotamian civilization. All right, so the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers have their source in the Armenian highlands, from which they flow southward to the Persian Gulf. The land between these two rivers is called Mesopotamia, which is a Greek word meaning land between the rivers. Tapping these rivers for irrigation entailed immense planning and labor. To keep the irrigation canals free from silt, as well as to control the amount of water flowing through them. Because any disruption of this flow meant the destruction of the crops. The danger of uncontrolled waters was especially great at flood season, usually April to June. Since this period coincided with the chief growing season, flooding spelled disaster to crops and settlements alike and archaeological finds confirm that it often occurred. This land between the rivers had no natural barriers to protect it, and the people who first exploited the waters of the rivers and the rich soil of the valley were exposed to constant attacks. This constant assault had a significant effect on Mesopotamian society, but they also made possible the spread of Mesopotamian influence outward into the more primitive areas. There is danger in ascribing too much influence to environment in determining the character of a people's history and culture. Yet physical conditions in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley did generate a deep sense of insecurity among its inhabitants. The everlasting threats of flood, drought, famine, and invasion bred an attitude of uncertainty and fatalism that is reflected in Mesopotamian literature and art. But the same conditions can and do conversely breed effort and creative thought in an attempt to overcome adversity. Perhaps this is the reason for the intensity with which life was lived in Mesopotamia and the richly varied response to human existence these people managed to develop. The development of higher civilization in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley began about 4000 BC, with the conquest of the ancient inhabitants of the southern part of the area by a new people, the agricultural Sumerians. Their origins have not been established, but they appear to have come from the east, perhaps forced to move by the progressive drying up of the entire Near East. The growing complexities of the irrigation system and the increasing population placed a premium on management and organization skills and led to the formation of the more structured and sophisticated city, in which authority to govern both inhabitants and the agricultural operation was vested in a single person or group. Thus the first political manifestation of advancing civilization in the land of Sumer, as the southern portion of Mesopotamia was often called, was the appearance of several city-states, consisting of an urban center and the surrounding farmlands. By 3000 BC, many such communities existed each with a large population, and each jealous of its independence. During this same period, Semitic people moved from the Arabian desert into an area of southern Mesopotamia called Akkad, lying immediately north of Sumer. The governance of the typical Sumerian city-state was grounded in religious faith, the Sumerians believed that each city-state was originally created by a god who had rolled back the primeval flood, made the earth appear, and fashioned the city and its inhabitants out of the mud. The city, therefore, belonged 
to the god, and its citizens were his slaves, charged with serving him in every way. As the city-states first took form, each was apparently governed by a group of elders, who consulted with an assembly of free men in making the decisions by which the will of the gods was carried out. This primitive democracy did not last long. Probably for the sake of efficiency, power was more and more concentrated in the hands of a single leader. The system grew into a theocratic kingship, in which the king's power was based on his role as the agent of the patron god, the true ruler of the community. The priest-king centered his activities in the temple, and surrounded himself with priest assistants. From the temple flowed orders directing the numerous communal activities required to form the lands of the gods. And back to the temple flowed huge income gathered from the lands reserved for the support of the god, the house, his temple, and his agents on earth, the priests. The temple complex became the nerve center of the entire community. Specialists whose skills were needed to conduct the numerous rituals in honor of the god congregated there. So did the ever-increasing hordes of overseers, tax collectors, surveyors, engineers, record keepers, and planners who enacted the directives of the priest king. Its many activities nourished the arts, architecture, writing, learning, skilled crafts, and trade. Slowly, the priest king began to distance himself from the temple community to assume a more secular status. The king did not surrender his role as representative of the patron god. His power was still theocratically based. But he exercised that power more independently by creating a non-priestly circle of agents to assist him, and drawing many civic functions away from the temple to the palace, which became the center of civic life. The priests were increasingly reduced to strictly cult functions. The changing character of Sumerian city-state governments was probably related to political problems in Mesopotamia after 3000 BC. By then, the city-states were solidly established. Still, Mesopotamia was plagued by a lack of political stability. In part, this resulted from the incessant attacks of outsiders, attracted by the riches of the valley communities. Even more disruptive was the violent rivalry among the city-states for land and power. The more successful a certain region was in ordering its internal structure, the more capable it was of harassing its neighbors. The political history of Mesopotamia during much of the third millennium BC centered around coping with the problems of barbarian attacks and incessant intercity warfare. The solution was eventually found in the formation of empires ruled by kings who developed new political techniques for keeping peace and order among smaller political entities. The first attempts at shaping a new political order were made by Sumerian cities. At various times between 3000 and 2400 BC, strong military leaders succeeded in establishing temporary mastery over other cities, but these so-called empires were short-lived. Ultimately, Semites proved more skilled in uniting Mesopotamia. The first great Semitic empire builder, Sargon I, emerged about 2400 BC. Ancient legend cast him in the role of a man of humble origin, set adrift in a basket in the bulrushes by an errant mother when he was an infant, and rescued and raised as a gardener 
until the gods called him to greatness. More reliable records indicate that Sargon was a servant in the royal household of a minor Semitic king whose office he took over. Sargon's empire was sustained until about 2200 BC by his descendants. Its excessive size made it vulnerable to outside attacks and internal resistance from the Sumerian city-states. By 2000 BC, a new group of Semitic people, the Amorites, who had only recently installed themselves in the river valley after migrating from the Arabian desert. Early in the second millennium BC, several Amorite chieftains created petty kingdoms at the expense of the Sumerian city-states. Out of this setting emerged the greatest of the Amorite leaders, Hammurabi, the ruler of the city-state of Babylon. His reign, extending from about 1792 to 1750 BC, was distinguished by military exploits. He repeated the conquests of Sargon I. Babylon became a great city, the seat of a government that maintained peace and unity over a broad territory. But the brilliance of Hammurabi and his successors provided the Amorite Empire no safety from outside assaults. Shortly after 1750 BC, foreign peoples like the Hittites and the Kassites began to push in from the north. Before this, the principal political challenge facing a king of kings, as Hammurabi called himself, was to overcome the differences that divided the peoples he ruled. He was especially successful in resolving this problem. One of Hammurabi's achievements was to complete the destruction of the monopoly of power previously held by the priests. He created a new concept in which the king himself was judge, lawgiver, and general in his own right. This powerful figure served as a symbolic center around which his subjects could rally, thus undercutting, undercutting the dependence upon priests who ruled over small areas that a god was believed to have made sacred. Hammurabi also developed institutions that enabled him to exercise the powers he claimed. Backed by a well-organized army, ready to curb threats to peace in his empire. He established a Babylon, at Babylon a centralized bureaucracy with specialized departments of finance, public works, justice, and defense. He subdivided his empire into local units and sent out royal servants to collect taxes, raise troops, suppress uprisings, and judge disputes. He emerges as a tireless administrator who paid careful attention to every detail in his extensive realm. Hammurabi used religion as a unifying force, promoting the worship of Marduk, once a deity in Babylon alone, now throughout his empire. Marduk was presented as having conquered the other gods, and therefore gained the right to rule their lands on earth. Never, however, did Hammurabi's power depend solely on religion. Probably the most significant of all Hammurabi's measures was his famous code of law. It is no longer possible to hail him as history's first lawgiver, for it is now evident that earlier Sumerian rulers had drawn up codes and that Hammurabi's was a synthesis of these. But by the very act of synthesis, he took an important step toward providing his subjects with a common set of rules for property, wages, marriage, family affairs, crime, commercial exchange, and inheritance. Today, most people are put off by the brutal punishments listed but the code is better thought of in terms of its common sense, humane approach 
to basic problems, protection for women, children, and slaves, fairness in commercial exchange, protection for the property of soldiers on duty, standard procedures for handling disputes, debt relief for victims of flood and drought. On the whole, the Code probably represented an enlightened concept of justice that drew people to accept Hammurabi's rule and to join the larger community of his empire. A wide variety of crops were cultivated, along with barley, sesame, usually for oil, and date palms. For tools, they had a spade, crude wooden plow, a sickle, and a flail were the primary agricultural tools. Usually at this time, I would also show students uh, certain examples of these as they would be used um, in a visual mode. Unfortunately, YouTube doesn't like my doing that copyright infringement and all of that, so I'll let you look up these types of things. What is a hand sickle different than a two-handed scythe? Uh, what is a flail? How it's used, that type of thing. Flails are used to knock the seeds off of the uh, parent plant. And of course, I would go through how uh, that would then be winnowed, meaning it would be placed in a um, shallow basket. The seeds and other uh, flakes of the parent plant would be tossed up into the air, and the lighter flakes would blow away, leaving the heavier seeds. And that would make it easier for them to grind only the seeds to make flour. The horse, while known, seems not to have played any significant role in economic life. Pigs and sheep rounded out their menus. The prime agricultural unit was the large farm. It was tilled by gangs of laborers, some semi-free peasants and others slaves under the careful supervision of the landlord or his agents. As payment, the agricultural laborers were given their pay in the produce. There were also some independent farmers who cultivated their acreage with the aid of a slave or two. On the whole, however, land ownership tended to be confined to a small group of nobles. In the early Sumerian period, the temple priests nearly monopolized control of the land. By Hammurabi's time, although the myth that all land belonged to the patron god was still maintained, a non-priestly aristocracy, chiefly soldiers and royal agents, had gained possession of a considerable part of the land, usually by a grant from the king. Lack of many raw materials, especially stone and metals, made trade a necessity in Mesopotamia. Every city had a class of people who spent their lives trading with neighboring cities or in the uncivilized areas surrounding the river valley. The Code of Hammurabi makes it clear that highly developed business methods had evolved to aid commerce, among them being complicated contracts, standard weights and measures, credit buying, lending for interests, deeds, and promissory notes. Mesopotamian civilization is comprehensible only in terms of Mesopotamian religion, for religious beliefs and practices permeated every facet of life. But our knowledge is scanty. The origins of Mesopotamian religion lie in the remote and inaccessible past. When records began to be kept, most religious ideas 
were already formed and stable, and the scribes were little concerned with describing their evolution or content logically. From the evidence we do have, we can draw a few conclusions. We know, for example, that Mesopotamian religion was polytheistic. Perhaps the most basic conviction of all Mesopotamians was the belief that every phenomenon was caused by spirits living in all things. Then men realized that some of these gods were more powerful than others, and thus worthy of greater attention. This heightened awe was felt especially toward the spirits who controlled the forces of nature. Among Sumerians and Semites alike, the worship of the forces of nature fixed on Enu, the sky god, Enlil, the god of the air, and Enke, god of the earth and waters. Hardly less important were the astral deities, Nana, sometimes called the goddess Sin in Semitic, Utu, the sun god. One of these five was often accepted as the founder and present owner of a city and its inhabitants. Another deity almost universally worshipped in the valley was the goddess of fertility, whose power renewed all nature every spring. This great mother, called Inanna by the Sumerians and Ishtar by the Semites, had a special appeal to the ordinary person living close to the soil, to whom the annual miracle of renewal was most obvious. These gods were represented as human beings, possessing terrible powers, and capable of doing great damage to anyone who displeased them. But they were not alone in the universe. Each family and individual worshipped lesser gods, who controlled the multitude of activities that surrounded human existence. Each also believed that the world was filled with demons, capable of causing no end of discomfort and misfortune. Mesopotamians gave to their gods a style of life similar to their own, so that divine society reflected human society, though the priests would claim that it was just the opposite. Since the people believed that each city-state was the property of a god, some explanation had to be given when one city-state was conquered by another. Usually this resulted in a myth about a similar war between the gods, with one conquering the other, and the defeated people usually accepted the conquering god as their chief deity, their old god being reduced to a subordinate position. Mythology grew from an urge to understand where they came from and how the universe was ordered. The result was a series of elaborate creation myths explaining our particular god, such as Marduk, subdued the primeval chaos, fashioned the families of gods, created and positioned the heavens, the stars, the seas, and the land, and filled the universe with living things. But where did men fit into this religious scheme of things? Well, a man was viewed as a slave of the gods, created by them to carry out their will without question. They were vengeful, angry gods, apt at any moment, and for any reason, to heap disaster upon their slaves. Men, therefore, bore a terrible burden in trying to keep their unpredictable masters happy. The care and feeding of the gods was crucial in this respect. Magnificent temples were built as dwellings, and every care was lavished on decoration and furnishings. Sumptuous banquets were prepared daily, and served with great ceremony. 
troops of priests and priestesses, organized by specialties, stood constantly ready to serve, to feed, to bathe, to perfume, to fan, to sing for, and even make love to the gods. Whole city states labored to provide the building materials, the metals, the bread, the beer, the fruit, and all the other things needed to make life comfortable for the priests, uh, the gods, I mean. Great festivals, like the spring New Year celebration, were organized in their honor. A major part of the wealth and creative talent of the whole community was poured into this effort to make them pleased with their earthly slaves. Aside from the great temples, people gave offerings to placate the spirits at countless smaller temples and shrines in houses, on the farms, and in the streets. No project, great or small, was ever undertaken without a ritual performance. First, to ask the gods to look with favor on the venture, and later to thank them for its success. As one might expect, the Mesopotamians were especially anxious to find out in advance what the gods might be planning. They developed a whole battery of prediction techniques. Dreams were interpreted, and the entrails of animals were studied to find signs of the future. The movement of the stars was carefully observed, and the astrologer was a powerful figure in society. A misnomer in the Jesus myth has three kings from the east visiting him, when in fact it was three wise men, meaning astrologers, or those who gazed at the stars. Yet the Mesopotamians had no god who placed heavy ethical demands on his believers. Seldom did they give much thought, therefore, to the problem of moral standards as a facet of religious life. Perhaps this lack of concern with morality and ethics was connected with the absence of any deep feeling about immorality. Mesopotamians believed that the dead passed on to a land of no return, somewhere underground, where dust is their food, clay their sustenance, where they see no light and dwell only in darkness. Very little attention was paid to expensive burial or to the care for the dead. Religion was concerned chiefly with sustaining earthly life. By and large, the Sumerians were the original artistic creators in Mesopotamia. The Semites sometimes modified and developed Sumerian cultural accomplishments, but more often they merely imitated them. Culturally, the two peoples merged so that a common pattern of culture rooted in ancient Sumer embraced the entire area of Mesopotamia. The Sumerians developed a writing system during the 4th millennium BC. Their original method of writing employed pictographs, images denoting activities, but gradually a system of symbols representing sounds was developed. After Sargon I, the Sumerian written language began to be replaced by the Semitic, called Akkadian. However, learned men continued to study Sumerian, so that a considerable body of Sumerian literature has survived. Both peoples wrote on clay tablets, pressing the symbols into soft clay with a wedge-shaped reed stylus, and then baking the tablets. This writing has been called cuneiform, a term from the Latin word meaning wedge. And usually at this particular time, I also show a video on cuneiform writing. And again, you can find that somewhere on YouTube. There are many of them. Uh, 
giving you an example of what it looked like and how they would have gone about in the process. But again, can't do that in this format because it's going to be on on YouTube and YouTube's going to censor stuff and yeah, big problem. Anyway, writing in the early Sumerian cities probably developed for record keeping purposes. Once a usable system was perfected, it was employed to preserve an extensive body of literature, which can be classified into a few major genres. The most impressive writing were the magnificent religious epics, of which the Creation Epic and the Epic of Gilgamesh are the best examples. The Creation Epic consists of a series of stirring episodes describing how Marduk won supremacy over the spirit world and created the earth and man. The Epic of Gilgamesh recounts the doings of a legendary hero named Gilgamesh, who was a ruler of one of the city-states. His search for immortality and his realization, eventually, that it was only for the gods. Several pieces of so-called wisdom literature, embodying advice on how to get along in this world, have also survived. There were attempts at historical writing in the form of chronicles recounting the deeds of famous rulers. The Mesopotamians were prolific letter writers as well. In reading this literature, one is often struck by the similarities it bears in theme, style, and form to segments of the Old Testament, written down more than a thousand years later. This likeness suggests that the Mesopotamian literary tradition helped shape the minds and aesthetics of many later generations. Their art did not survive well because of the lack of stone and the consequent use of more perishable materials. Their major architectural works were temples. From earliest times, every Sumerian city had a large and elaborate temple to the patron deity at its center. Near it was often a temple tower called a ziggurat, designed as a series of terraces, one on top of another, each succeeding layer smaller than the one below it. A sanctuary remote from the world was placed atop the final in terrace. The purpose of these towers is not clear. Perhaps they served as tombs of some kind, or man-made replicas of the mountains where the valley dwellers used to worship before they came to the lowlands, or perhaps they were bridges to heaven. Magnificent brick palaces were also built for the kings, especially after the royal establishment began to separate from the temple. A considerable amount of sculpture has survived, although this art too was restricted by the shortage of good stone in Mesopotamia. Most of the three-dimensional statues are portrayals of gods and kings. Sculptors took some pains to give a distinctive character to a face, but concerned themselves very little with a realistic rendering of the body. They were governed by ideal geometric forms, cylinders, and cones in conceiving their work. The statues are solid, stiff, motionless. More realistic and animated scenes were created by sculptors working in low relief. The most exquisite carving was done by the seal makers, who made miniaturized scenes on stone that could be used to press an identifying mark into clay. It is most likely these people who indeed have given us our measurement of time, as they used 60 seconds to equal one minute, 60 minutes to equal one hour, and 24 hours for an entire day. 
also associated with this region, mainly from Iran, is the religion of Zoroastrianism. We are not sure exactly where or when the founder of the religion Zoroaster, or as he is also sometimes known, Zarathustra. Zoroaster is the Greek corruption of the old Iranian word Zarathustra, which generally means he who plows with camels. But most scholars place his origins around 600 or so BC. Well, there are those who place him considerably earlier than this point, but most generally ascribe it to about 600. Now, there are a number of different versions of his life. But, by and large, the basic story is of his birth, where his mother gives birth without having had relations with her husband. Instead, there is a story a story of his mother having been given a ritual drink uh, formed from the substance of one of the gods. And she thus is imbued by the god with a child. A child, of course, becomes Zoroaster. His father, uh, her, his mother's husband, was from the military caste, which is of the higher rank in society. And it was expected that once he reached his age of majority, which was 15 at that time and place, that he would follow in his stepfather's footsteps and take upon him the kusti, the sacred belt of passage from childhood into adulthood, and that it would be the martial belt, war, uh, uh, the warrior way. But instead, he chose a different path. He decided that he wanted to learn more about the spiritual world. And so he will apprentice himself off with a number of meguses, individuals who proclaimed themselves to have supernatural abilities and powers and knowledge. These were individuals who knew the true names of spirits, and using these true names, they could compel spirits to leave people and thus cure them of ills. In addition, they also would foretell the future. There were also magicians able to frighten and amuse the populace with certain magical abilities. After years of this apprenticeship, he will decide that the way that people were living at this time, which was polytheistic, was wrong. And it is at this time also that he is supposedly visited by a 
divine messenger from the one God, Ahura Mazda. And this message he is to bring to others. But for the next, oh, ten years or so, no one listens to him. Oh, they listen, but they don't accept. Until at age 40, where at this point he really only has one convert, his cousin. But now, Hura Mazda, fate, destiny, whatever you want to refer to it as, will intervene. And what happens is that supposedly there is a king by the name of Vistaspa, who has a favorite horse, the one that he rode into battle on that always meant that he would, if he rode on that horse, he would be um, guaranteed victory. This horse grew sick. So he went to his physicians uh, who were unable to cure the horse. He then had them executed. He then went to his priests and they were unable to cure the horse and he have has them executed. He then sends out messengers to bring in individuals to come and heal his horse. If they do so, they will be given half his kingdom. And at first, many people come in with unusual remedies, and they all fail to cure the horse, and they all are executed, till eventually few and then eventually none come to try to cure the horse, until one day Zoroaster arrives. Now, there are a number of stories associated with his arrival as well. It's said that the, the roof of the palace opened up, and um, jumping through this opening uh, sprang Zoroaster, and he will um, do a number of... Uh, magical types of actions that will uh, cause the king to see him in a, uh, a light of just being completely transfixed. Uh, one story says that um, Zoroaster was able to play with a cube of fire and was unburned. Things of this nature. And then, of course, he cures the horse. And with that, the king is convinced that this guy knows what he's doing. And so he will listen to Zoroaster and be converted. And as the king is converted, so too goes the kingdom. And with that, the practice of Zoroastrianism spreads out. Now, what exactly was the ideology of Zoroastrianism? Well, essentially, there is the good spirit, uh, Hura Mazda, and the bad spirit, Angra Manyo. And it's, there is, again, a bit of controversy as to exactly where this bad entity came from. Certainly, all are in agreement that at first there was only Uhura Mazda, the light. But eventually, the darkness, Angra, comes forth. Some claim that it was always in existence alongside Uhura Mazda. Others, however, claimed that Uhura Mazda created this lesser entity, but that eventually 
the light or Omazda would triumph over the darkness. Angra. In either case, the core ideology is a kind of um, yin and yang, uh, good and evil, light and dark. To Zoroaster, fire was a symbol of Ahura Mazda. It functions like sacraments in Christianity as a visible sign of the god's presence. Fire also purifies, and in pre-Zoroastrian times, it was often used in sacrifices. To let the fire die was to uh, was a criminal act. Zoroaster will forbid animal sacrifices and the use of intoxicants like soma in religious ceremonies. An emphasis is placed upon telling the truth, for these are things that come from the light and the dark. Lies spring forth from. Zoroastrian temples appear outwardly as little different than most other temples. Priests are hereditary. And the sacred flame is fed at least five times a day, burning in an urn on a four-legged stone pedestal. There is no organized community worship corresponds to, say, the Christian Sunday gathering. Worshippers come in, in families, small groups. They wash their exposed parts of their bodies, their hands, their feet, their face. They take off their shoes. They give offerings of money and sandalwood to the priests, recite prayers, and then leave the sanctuary without turning their backs on the sacred flame. The most unusual Zoroastrian religious practice concerns their funerary customs. Dead bodies are considered unclean, since death is a thing against nature, and a direct effect of the evil spirit. Therefore, they will not contaminate the pure elements of fire or earth by contact with a dead body. So shortly after death, the family gathers for a period of formal mourning, following which the body is born on a, a bier and these uh, buyers consist of different levels, one for men, one for women, one for children. And the body is then placed in its appropriate position inside the open tower and left there for the vultures to eat. Following this, the remaining bones are placed in a sealed stone well in the center of the tower. And because Uhura Mazda is the great one God. In the end, he is victorious over the darkness, and at the final time, when the darkness has been banished, there will be a great resurrection of all those who have died in the past. And at this time, they will be tested by a fiery ordeal. Each individual will walk through the fire, and the flames will decide if they are pure or if they are not pure. The flames will not harm those who are pure. It will be as if they're swimming in water. The impure, however, the fires will burn them. They then will be cast away 
into the darkness. But this is not an eternal punishment. It is only a temporary punishment. Once there, the darkness has been burnt away from them, they can eventually be brought back and live in a, uh, a place of light, a kind of paradise, if you will. Well, that gives us our uh, Middle East. Uh, we will continue with the next lecture with Egypt. Thank you.